OC World is made possible by the generous contributions of the Marisla Foundation, the Keith and Judy Swain Family Foundation, Orange County Community Foundation, the Cordoba Corporation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Morlock, guest hosting for OC World. We have known television networks as profit centers reliant on advertising revenues as their business model. We're also familiar with public broadcasting service channels as nonprofit, non-commercial alternatives, which rely on sponsorships, grants, and small donor contributions. With the newspaper industry in systemic decline, we're seeing an increase in donor-reliant media outlets to bring us our news. In Sacramento, Cal Matters has been around since 2015. This show, OC World, is also a nonprofit multimedia company. Orange and Los Angeles counties now have a new nonprofit in town, making a local presence in 2018. By many accounts, the Epic Times has the fourth largest subscriber base in the country, and it has been establishing a strong footprint here after being founded in 2000 and slowly growing its circulation around the nation and world. In an area once dominated by the Los Angeles Times and Orange County Register, as well as numerous community newspapers, it is hard to believe that another printed newspaper would even have a chance. While the Orange County Register recently moved from its landmark building along the Santa Ana Freeway at Grand Avenue and Santa Ana Boulevard, the Epoch Times recently relocated into a 27,000 square foot commercial space in Irvine, where we are today. According to the company's website, the Epoch Times is affiliated with the Falun Gong spiritual movement as a way to respond to the communist repression and censorship in China. It's described in certain political circles as a far-right media company, but declares itself as free from any government or political influences. The Orange County edition of the newspaper has a circulation of roughly 16,000 readers, and they also produce the public affairs show, California Insider. Here to educate OC World viewers about the Epoch Times is its political affiliations, media properties, business model, and reputation is Siamak Karami, chief editor of its local edition and host of California Insider. And I should mention that I write opinion editorials for the Epoch Times and that I have been interviewed by Siamak for his television show. Today, however, tables have been turned, and I'm here to serve as moderator of a discussion about the regional presence of this organization in the Orange County, Los Angeles area, about its nonprofit business model, and about the future of print media. CMAC, welcome to your own studio. It's good to have you. Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you for having me. So recently, Congressman Ralph Norman from South Carolina read the Epoch Times history into the congressional record. Uh, why would he do that? Well, most people don't know about our background. And uh, we have grown significantly. A lot of people want to know who we are, where we're coming from, what we're doing. And, um, and what is written on Wikipedia, you mentioned in some political p circles, with, they say this is a far-right media. That's not that that understanding is not true because this paper was founded by a group of immigrants because there was a big persecution in China. There was a spiritual practice, it's called Falun Gong, Falun Dafa, it's about living by truth, compassion, tolerance, peaceful practice, came to public in the 90s, grew to 100 million people practicing in 99, then it got persecuted, it got banned, people that were doing it got thrown into labor camps, and the media here did very little to tell their stories of the people that were getting persecuted in China. And Epoch Times started by a group of Chinese Americans to talk about this persecution and cover it. Initially, it was all about human rights. And then as time went by, we got much better at understanding and covering the news. And as things got more extreme in, in this country, we gained more and more uh, readership. So your newspaper covers a wonderful array of topics. I mean, from national, local here in Orange County, but you also include recipes and food, you have medical advice, you have some sports, 
you have a lot on art. I mean, it, you're, you're, it's a very thorough daily newspaper. Well, what have I missed that you're covering? We have mind and body, which is health section. We have art, we have life and tradition. We have a lot of different, we wanna help, um, we wanna help people to, to have for their whole lifestyle. It can, it can be a way for people to live using the paper. You know, uh, There's a lot of traditional values. There's a lot of articles that talk about family, family values that we cover with the paper. So husbands can read the news, wives can read the lifestyle, and, and sometimes vice versa, depending on people, what people like. Some people like the sports, some people like the puzzles. Uh, we have really interesting puzzles. And uh, the goal for us is to be the media source that people go to, day to the, on a day-to-day -day basis. So you only publish weekdays, sort of like the, Wall, the old Wall Street Journal model, uh, where they would have weekends off. But they've added Saturdays for you know, about 18 years or so. Why, are, why only on weekdays? We are, um, we are going to grow to, to weekends as well over time. Okay. At this stage, we're piloting the weekdays. So how does your paper increase its circulation? Are you uh, providing discounts on subscriberships? Do you, you, I know you give free newspapers. Is it word of mouth? What's, what's the secret it's sauce? Word of mouth, deals. And you know, print at this time and age, a lot of people wouldn't want to do a print newspaper. The reason we have really committed to print is because when you do print, you have to really watch what you're writing and re-edit the articles multiple times. You have to go through a thorough review with the editorial team in order to print. So what it does, it actually improves your journalism. It improves the quality of, of your reporting. That's why we've committed to print, and we think that print has a lot of potential. Um, we the goal is over time to, to make this bigger and more comprehensive as things go by and really become the partner for our audience. Every day deliver the, the news to them in a way they can um, benefit from it in a way where there is, when they read these articles, because they're comprehensive, because they're deep, it will help them with critical thinking, better understanding, better understanding of their, their community and different perspectives. So uh, we have an industry that has been scaling back. We have the internet, we have content that's available for free. We have Craigslist that is doing free advertising. So a whole revenue base disappeared for for-profit newspapers. A and yet you're, you're expanding into a 27,000 square foot facility. So one of the sad things that I've seen, you know, I've lived here for over 20 years now in the U.S. I'm from Iran originally. I've lived in Mexico. I've lived in China. And I moved to San Diego um, about 23 years ago, 22 years ago. One of the sad things I've seen that's happened to the, to the media industry is that when the local reporters, when people stop advertising with the local newspapers and they have to cut back on the local reporters and now the local reporters are not watching the city councils. You know, there's, there's a lot of things that happen that before the local reporters would tell the community about it and, um, and now those things are going unreported. And um, well, there are some gossips in websites and, and what has happened is everything has become online and um, when you do online reporting or the digital reporting, the more um, sensational the headline is, the more viewership you get. And as a result of it, um, if people that are on the right or people that are on the left, you know, they get headlines that are more geared to them and the community becomes more and more divided and things get more and more emotional. And um, for us, we, uh, over time, what we wanted to do is we wanted to stay more neutral. And uh, focusing on print, it, it helps us with that. But in general, the fact that we've been able to grow is that over, over the years, we've been building, building more uh, loyal base of audience that trust us. And uh, in the last five, six years, we've grown significantly because we, kind of state more rational. And I say that, and some people may think that some of our coverage may not be good or might be extreme, but we've tried to stay more rational. And as time goes by, some of these things that we predicted in the past will become true. And then more and more people will come to read us. 
So essentially, we warned people about the Chinese Communist Party many, many years ago. And we've been covering China, and some people thought that we were extreme towards the Chinese Communist Party. We're actually telling the truth about them. And after the pandemic, people are starting to realize in this country that, oh, this, this was true. The Chinese Communist Party may not be our friend. There is a lot of other reporting that we have done that as time goes by, people will, will see and understand that uh, this is a unique paper. And um, when people see this is a unique paper, they're willing to pay for it. And they're willing to, they, they appreciate what we're doing. They're willing to pay for it. And over the last five, six years, we have seen the results of all the work that we put in uh, in the years before. So are, are the majority of your subscribers Chinese? They are all mostly American. They, um, okay. We have, we are in 20, um, we're in 21 languages in 35 countries. Um, in the U.S., majority of subscri our subscribers are American. And, you know, whether they might be Chinese-American, they, they could be different, different ethnicities. But uh, because of our coverage, we, we have covered China in a sense. We have covered a lot of other things here in a more balanced way that um, the rest of the media has gotten very emotional. Whatever side they're on, there's a lot of emotion in the media. There's a lot of negativity and hatred. And we've tried to stay out of that uh, in our paper. You know, we focus on issues. We focus on policies. We don't focus on people. We don't focus on negativity, hatred. So when readers read the paper, and, and, and I encourage people to, to read it, read the articles, uh, uh, just read it once or twice, you get a different feel from the articles. You feel calm. You don't feel anxiety. You don't feel a lot of emotion. And as people experience the, the paper, then they, they realize this is the old school news they used to get. So we did a lot of sampling. The reason the paper grew is we, we did a lot of sampling. We'd send the sample paper to people. People pick it up, read it, and they realize this is a new newspaper. This is different. This is what, how it used to be back in the day. So because of that, people want to want to give us a chance, subscribe and, and read it. So it's an issue of balance. You use neutral, but I would say it's a balanced paper that tries to. Yeah, and you, you know use what? Use the word compassionate a lot. Absolutely. You know, there is there is one point that I need to make for the viewers is that when I came to this country, one of the things that I really appreciated was the fact that people could tolerate each other and work together. And I saw that in the football field. Not in the football field. When I was watching football, I imagine this Iranian guy coming from Iran, like not really knowing what's going on in watching football because we would watch soccer. Right. And people are hitting each other. Big guys are hitting each other. And what was fascinating is what happens in the audience. When you look into the audience, you see different people, different fans with different jerseys sitting next to each other and having a great time. This never happens in a soccer game anywhere else in the world. People will kill each other if they were watching a <laughs> soccer game. You know, if you put the fans of two different teams. So what it tells you is that this country, the people here, are very open-minded. They're willing to work together. They're willing to sit next to each other and enjoy a game together, even though they have different opinions. And this is what we want to bring back into the media. Unfortunately, this type of thinking has gone out of media and has gone out of politics. And hopefully we can help bring it back as a paper. So you have an emphasis on Falun Gong. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could help explain what it is and what its principles are. So Falun Gong is an ancient Chinese mind and body practice. Uh, it's about living by truth, compassion, and tolerance, and trying to put others first. Always think about others. And um, we it. It came to public in 92, and there's, there's five exercises, gentle movements in meditation. And uh, it came to public in 92. A lot of people started doing it in China. It's very good for health. It's very good for um, mind and body. It's, it makes you relax. Always you have to consider others first. And a lot of religious people, if they follow their religion, whatever religion is, they, they might feel the same way, you know, always putting others first. And, and when it came to public in the 90s in China, a lot of people, imagine this communist country, uh, people that were stealing things from the government-owned factories. And after they started practicing Falun Dafa, Falun Gong, they started bringing things back. And they would say, oh, this is a bad thing. I don't want to steal. 
and, and then they started changing. You could see the Chinese society changing. In 90, um, unfortunately in 99, um, the, the Chinese government did a survey. They realized there's 100 million people practicing. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese leader at that time, the leader of the Communist Party, they knew this is very peaceful. It has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with government. But in 99, the, found, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party realized that the person that has brought Falun Gong to public is the most popular person in China. So he couldn't have that. So he started this persecution. And they used the media to demonize the people, say bad things about them. At first, it didn't work. But later on, they started creating these uh, incidents about it, fake incidents. And then they would report on that. And then they would get the foreign media, the American media, and other countries to report on that. And over time, they were able to create a bad rep for Falun Gong. Now, is Falun Gong sort of uh, your donor base? Is that where everything started? Well, you said it. What happened it was, yeah, it's a good question. Actually, the way the paper started is because our founder, his name is John Tang. He was a physicist here. He was practicing Falun Gong. And uh, he saw his persecution. He tried to go to media. Nobody wanted to cover it. There was a couple of people that covered the persecution. but. Uh, Nobody really wanted to cover it. He went to different papers. He even was willing to pay them to put an ad in the papers to say about the persecution in China. They didn't want to do that. So he started the paper out of his basement as a nonprofit with no money, no experience, and started building it from there. And a lot of people in the beginning that got involved were, were also practicing Falun Gong. And they were trying to do that to help their, their friends in China because they were all getting arrested. And nobody knew why they were getting arrested. And uh, in the beginning, we even had an office in China. And the editor went to jail. They, they all got arrested. We had p people reporting from inside China. And they, they all got arrested. The editor went to jail for over 10 years, got tortured. Um, but that's how the paper started by a lot of people that, that were practicing Falun Gong to talk about it, to talk about the human rights issue there. And then as, as time developed, more and more people came. And now it's like there's a lot of people that do, don't practice Falun Gong, but they're, they're involved with the paper. And we don't really, as long as people are aligned with our values, they care about the media, they care about being balanced. And, and then we, we, we hire journalists, that, especially old school journalists. So uh, you also include stories on biblical characters like Esther or the Apostle John. or So what... Could you explain that a little bit? On yeah, so we are actually, the, the way our paper works is we, we were founded to actually, um, one of the missions, one of the key missions, it was just to talk about this persecution in China. And then we are also bringing traditional values back. So it could be other religions, it could be any, any traditional stories we want to cover it. And it could be other point of views. We're, we're open to covering different points of views. It's a, it's a newspaper for everybody. But it got founded because of the persecution of Falun Gong. Okay, so you're an interesting personality, you know, handling this venture. Uh, you recently did an, uh, a documentary on, on leaving California. Um, and I just want to know, um, since you're watching everyone leave, why are you coming in? The juxtaposition is sort of interesting to me. Um, could you just, how do you reconcile that? You know, the, the last thing I thought I would do, I would do a documentary on that. Like, because when I moved here, it was the most fascinating, best place in the world. Like, I came from Iran, and I lived in Mexico City. And when I was in Mexico City, all the crime, you know, I, I was you were always worried about getting kidnapped or things like that. And then in Iran, like, you didn't have any freedom. As a young person, you couldn't do anything, and uh, you wouldn't have a future. And so when I came here and I was, I went to San Diego, and I saw the standard of a living, you know, like kids that I was going to community college with, they all had surfboards and they would go surfing. You know, this is something rich people would do in Iran, you know, and in Mexico. And I felt like this was paradise. And what I realized is that the, the values, the culture, people wouldn't break the law. People wouldn't lie a lot. You know, people wouldn't, uh, people weren't corrupt. You know, you couldn't pay somebody off. These, these are very strong values inside this, this culture. And, and um, as time has gone, you know, as an immigrant, when you see that and you really appreciate it in a place, and especially when you live in a few different countries, you see how it is in each of them. And then you start to think, like, why is it like that over there? Why is it 
like this here. Mm -hmm. You know, especially in Mexico. Mexico is right across. You know, you yeah. cross the border and things change. And you so, know, so you're an immigrant. You come to the United States. You start a business. It's doing well. You hire a CEO to run it, and now you're doing this full time. Um, I, I'm just curious. Uh, you, I'm assuming you're not getting paid by the Epic Times that you're doing this. Oh, out we're of a actually devotion. getting paid salaries. Everybody's getting paid Epic Times okay. pay, but you know, I donate a lot of my my uh, my time to 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 the paper. And the thing is, what happened was um, I started a company in San Diego, and it grew, and then. Uh, I started practicing Falun Gong. I, I was doing it like living by truth, compassion, tolerance, but I was doing it kind of during my personal time. I, wouldn't doing it at, I wasn't doing it at work. I was trained by a different philosophy. You know, do whatever you can as long as it's legal and make a lot of money and then maybe donate a little bit to Harvard. That was the philosophy I was running my company. And then as I started practicing Falun Gong, I, at some point I was like, I need to tell, I really need to tell the truth. I can't exaggerate. So one day I went to a meeting with a cost, potential customer, and the CEO asked me, how many people do you have? And I would usually say 25, and 25 was not the true number. I really had eight people. This time, the CEO is asking me, potential customer, he's saying, like, how many, how many people? It's a big customer, and I say, I have to tell the truth. I say eight. And then he signs the contract, and he said, oh, you have eight studs. And then I realized my eight real people was much bigger than my 25 fake people. <laughs> So from then and on, I started incorporating these ideas into my work and became a different person. I started putting my team members um, ahead of me, really think about, it, think about them, care about them. And my business became a lot better. Mm. And I, become, I became so much relaxer. Then I realized these people are persecuted in China. And, and uh, so I started, a, and I was shocked because I lived in China. I didn't know about the organ harvesting they were doing to them in China. So I started a nonprofit to raise awareness on that. And then... At some point, I came in touch with Epoch Times, and I was very excited and intrigued with what they were doing. And uh, I, I could never picture myself working for a nonprofit and a media company, but then at some point, I decided to join them. So here you are. You're raising money. How's the fundraising going? Uh, fundraising is challenging, you know, and, uh, uh, but we are trying. You know, the, the, most, of the, most of the funding for the paper comes from our subscriptions, um, but we are hoping to get donors and big donors that, that, that actually are aligned with our values and don't want to change the editorial, like they don't want to get into the editorial side of things. You know, sometimes when you get donors, they want to get into the editorial side of things, but we, um, we are looking for, for people that are aligned with our values and let us run, run with it. So what is your vision then for the next two years? five years, 10 years, where, where will the Orange County, LA, Epic Times be? Will it be the entire state of California? What are your goals? The hope for us is to have a really big impact on, in California, in this, in this county and California. You know, that back in the day, the American newspapers would be the voice of the people. They'll be the voice of the people. They will also give feedback to policymakers. You know, if somebody did something wrong in the government, the newspapers would call them out and they would make them fix it. And we want to bring that back where we are advocating for the people. It doesn't matter you're Republican, Democrat, far left, far right, right in the middle, don't care about politics. We want to advocate for you. We want to be your voice. And at the same time, we also don't want to criticize politicians. We want to actually show them what's going on. Because a lot of times when people make policy, they might not really know what's going on. They might pass a law, and they think this is a really good law. They care about the people. They want to fix something, and then the outcome is bad. They, they can use us as a tool to give them the feedback so that they can fix things. You know, you're in a business, and so you already have a competitive marketplace. You have to obtain donations. You have to get ab subscribers, the paying subscribers. You have to get advertisers. Uh, but you have other pressures that are unique to your particular organization. Uh, and, and I'm just wondering, what can you share about the dynamics of coming out of a Chinese background? And, and how is that, you know, to use a phrase, how is that working for you? So we were the only voice that the Chinese Communist Party in the media really didn't have a lot of influence on. And they couldn't control us, and they didn't like us. 
and they tried to shut us down along the way. You know, when we would sell ads to people for our Chinese edition to a potentially Chinese restaurant or a Chinese business, the Chinese consulate will call them and will threaten them. If they want to go to China, they should cancel our ads. When we were small, we would see these kind of pressures um, directly. And we see all sorts of pressures. A lot of, I, I tell people we've been canceled by anybody and everybody, by vendors, by customers, because of the pressure from, that comes from the Chinese Communist Party. And most people don't think this is true, but even in the US, the Chinese Communist Party has a lot of influence, and we are dealing with it every day. CMAC, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Really appreciate your comments and uh, what you're doing. Uh, it's very admirable. Uh, we're, you're providing a new alternative for those of us in the Southern California region uh, to get our news. I also uh, appreciate your, your team and your staff. Thanks for letting us use your facilities. And I want to thank June Kim Lopez for allowing me the opportunity to guest host this incredible program. Thanks again, CMAC, and thank you for being with us. Appreciate it.